Tech Talks, House Rules. Join us on AVE Live, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us on Zoom. Watch on Facebook or YouTube from the AV Educate page or register as an attendee for the webinar. Live Q&A. Our guest will lead us through a guided demo and conversation about tonight's topic. We will take your questions and comments throughout the show. Don't wait until the end. Get your questions and comments in early to shape the conversation. We don't know it all. We're human and don't claim to know everything. We may demonstrate or discuss one way to do something, but that doesn't mean it's the only way to do it. If you found another way that is easier or yields better results, please share with the community so we can all learn together. Follow AV Educate. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and have a library of content on YouTube. Join us on Zoom for AV Tech Talks and to become a member of our community on Discord where the conversations, the learning, and the sharing continues. We are where you are. Place your phone over the QR code to come learn more about AV Educate.
Let's see if that's okay. Yep. Okay, so we should be back now with audio. So we understand uh, when my machine dumped uh, earlier, it changed the audio source for Zoom. So we understand that the streaming audience didn't have any audio for a little bit. Uh, so we apologize. Um, of course, you know, on the audio show, it seems like every time I do an audio show, we always have an audio issue. So um, with that, good, well, and I can hear on my monitoring machine that audio is back live audio wise. I had checked it during the intro stuff and that was playing fine, but the Zoom audio wasn't getting captured. It was an issue with the machine that dumped and then changed audio output sources in Zoom. So we apologize again. Uh, so what we're talking about tonight is signal gotcha. processing. <laughs> yep. Um, and all that you've missed is uh, Marty gave us a, a good definition of signal processing. So uh, Sean on Facebook, thank you for pointing out that we weren't getting audio. Appreciate that. So Marty, do you mind just kind of going over what signal processing is again? And sorry to the uh, Zoom audience who already heard this. Uh, it's a good review for the for the test that's later. Certainly. Anytime you do anything that changes the sound or the level of audio, you are processing it. Changing the level, changing the equalization, changing the dynamic range, um, adding an effect. All of that is considered processing. Even the, even the gain stages in your console is considered processing. It's also considered a type of distortion because you're changing something that wasn't there before. Awesome. Thank you. So, and what we did, uh, what, what I kind of demonstrated was going to my console and one of the other things that could count as signal processing is now I should be on your left side. If you're listening, uh, I'm on the left. And then if I switch and go this way, I should be on the right and I should be back in the center now. And some of you on mobile devices might've lost me when it was on the right. Uh, I mentioned that before. Uh, some mobile devices, the way they handle Zoom and other video conferencing uh, software applications don't do stereo audio. So you might have only gotten that in mono or you might have lost it to altogether, depending on the orientation of your phone. Sometimes if you're in usually in portrait mode, uh, a lot of times you, you'll only get mono. And then if you turn it to landscape, you might get the stereo audio back. So that's basically we got you back up to speed. And then Justin was going to talk to us about equalization EQ. So. Take it away, Justin. Sure. Um, pick up where I was, and I apologize. I'm working on a little bit of a voice today and a few less toys than I want. So if anyone out there in panel land has access to white noise or a graph, great. Um, what I was just saying, EQ, we can do it for a lot of things. As Marty said, it's effectively distortion. It's what we we sort of classify processing into either linear or nonlinear. What affects the entire signal equally? what changes portions of it. EQ is the ultimate definition of something that changes it selectively. Um, a term we kick around we really haven't defined yet is an octave, because we talk about that a lot and it applies a lot here. Um, in technical terms, an octave is a doubling of frequency, or in musical terms, it's a full musical octave, eight steps from an A to an A the next octave up. But where that affects us a lot in audio is nothing about the way we hear is linear. It's all exponential. So the bottom octave is 20 hertz to 40 hertz. The top one is 10,000 to 20,000. So as we're allocating power or balancing signal, we look at those as equal intervals, but they're very much not. So one of the things we use a lot, we hear kicked around the term pink noise or white noise. And the difference there, I have pink noise available to me, is when we talk about as a test signal pink noise, it's a signal, random signal that has equal energy per octave, which is say there's as much energy between 20 hertz and 40 hertz which, than there is between 10,000 and 20,000. White noise, equal energy per frequency, it's what you think of when you're thinking about just static from a radio. Uh, sounds very shrill to us. So pink noise. Just... Oh, Justin, we lost your microphone when, we went, when you went to the pink noise, just so you know. Oh, no, I should be back now. Yep. 
Maybe. Okay. <laughs> They're coming off the same feed. Um, so when we're looking at equalizing things, we tend to do it by octaves. And I want to just quick hit on some of the basics of EQ and touch a little on how we cross over between speaker systems. So um, let me grab a screen share. Um, when we are doing EQ, there's basically three things we're controlling when we're uh, tweaking on an EQ, which is um, we either we're changing the three parameters are the frequency we're making a change at, the amount that we are boosting or cutting it by, and the width of how we do it. So um, there's a bunch of filter shapes we can bring into play. We have what we call a parametric or a bell filter, which lets us decide, you know, where, how much we want to boost or cut where we want to boost or cut, and uh, how wide or narrow we want to do. You know, a very narrow filter is called a notch filter because it's just that. So these are what we call parametric or uh, you'll also hear them called bell filters because they can end up sort of bell shaped. So I'm just going to put a little something in the background here and tweak with it. Um, I'm just going to randomly put a filter in here. Now one of the interesting things, and I'll hear agreement or disagreement from the panel, is most people find that it's much less noticeable to the human ear when you cut something than when you boost it. Boosts tend to jump out a lot more, which is sort of funny because if Ed gets into parallel compression next week, that sort of works on the opposite thing with volume. But I'll put a little music in here and we'll just randomly boost and cut it so you hear the effect and you can also see it. Uh, a very important rule that I might as well say here, one of the basic rules and the curse of digital consoles is don't EQ with your eyes. And of course we're going to do it all looking at it here because we're on Zoom. But one of the big traps of EQ when you're trying to get something sounding right is staring at the screen. I don't know how many times I get people looking over my shoulder going, oh, that's pretty harsh. Well, how's it sound? Well, it sounds fine. Then don't worry about how it looks. But I'm just going to put a, uh, a bell filter in here and we'll play with the gain and the frequency a little so we can hear the effect. So let's get into a, another track here. I'll start by boosting because it's a little more noticeable. Or we can go the other way and cut. And same thing, right now this is fairly narrow. So that's your basic uh, bell filter. The other thing we can do is what we call shelving filters, which earn that name because in effect, that's what they do. They rise or fall, but when they get there, then they shelve off, which can be useful to, if you want to really darken something down or brighten it up, sorry, voice. And there's some more sort of exotic types we don't get into. Uh, and then the other thing that we do is what we call pass filters, um, which we can either use a high pass here that uh, lets us cut low end off.
which can be really useful for us either when people are talking you get a lot of plosive p's and t's that if you roll off some of that lower end i mean people can argue over the number usually there's really not much you need to get in the human voice below about 120. Some people come with a higher number, some will keep lower. A uh, lot good for cutting wind noise, things like that. You can really cut some of the noise out of there. Um, the opposite of a high pass is a low pass where you can cut some of the higher end out. Um, this is if you get really bright stuff. It's also, we kind of said last week, you know, where you're doing stereo analog in-ears um they're defined by an, a 19 kilohertz pilot tone so if you're mixing for people with ears if you cut it down to 17 or 18 you can cut the crud from getting in there um and we'll talk in just a second about crossovers which is how you divide things up between speakers which is basically either um on the low end you know if you're setting speaker that only wants to see lows then you can set it down to only take that much or on the high end you can take it to cut everything else off or if you do both it's what we call a bandpass um, so and that would be what you were just talking about with those crossovers that would be between like your subs and your your tops in a pa system yes uh, and again the most common thing we see a lot and unfortunately I don't have one in this processor today, is what we call a graphic EQ, which is just instead of setting filters selectively, you have fixed filters every one third of an octave. And again, that spacing changes. Um, but they're called graphics because if you look at the face of the unit, the individual sliders, how much they're up or down, sort of shows you the frequency response. So this is a crossover. This is going to sound a little funny because the way I have it set, there's two outputs here, uh, low and high. You can have these that split it three ways, four ways. Uh, right now, the low is set to go to your left ear. The high is set to go to your right. Um, so as you change the frequency, again, this is basically, this is a, uh, a high pass filter on the high side, lets everything above that frequency go through low pass filter on the low side lets everything below it go through um, i'm going to just put it in here and you'll kind of, as i shift the point you'll hear the split between high and low i always get the quiet part next track So that's shifting more and more of the signal to the left as you move the lows higher up. And that's going the other way. Now, also in a crossover, you can select, if you see, this is a little note up here, there's various curve shapes. You can set how steep they are. This changes 24 dB for every octave of frequency change. Um, you can make it much shallower. You know, I can make it so it only changes by 6 dB every octave. So it's a much more gradual crossover. You can go the other way and go, well, let's get really hard for here. You make it so you're doing, for look at the shape of the slopes. You can make it a really harsh cut over so you can go either way and then depending on your system you can also right now they're even you can go in and in a crossover you can say okay I want more lows so you can see your lows are now running significantly hotter compared to your highs. So it lets you tweak it around. And again, hey, unfortunately- Justin, I... sorry, do you have original sound turned on by any chance? I'm just, cause we're not getting as much of the low end as I, I think we probably should be. I should. Okay, just check it. Yep, give me a second. Let me get into the window. Let me drop that. Yeah, we are. 
Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Um, so any that's the quick in. Any questions, comments? That graphical of the crossover was a good example of when you change any parameter of it. Lake's GUI shows a good example of how it changes where the frequency actually crosses over. Yeah. It's which is unique. One... It's a unique uh, GUI for that. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that's probably further we want to get in this week, but if we get into arguments about how we handle subwoofers in PA systems, that's exactly the point, because as you turn up the lows, the point at which they cross goes up. So let me just, I'll just throw this up and then I'll let the world get on, Ed. I don't want to tie up too much here, Knight. Um, but yeah, if you look, we define the crossover as where it crosses at 6 dB down. So with the lows cranked up way up here, you're crossing here, but if you drop the lows back down again, then your crossover point drops back down here. So yeah, when you uh, change your levels between the various parts of your system, you change the crossovers too, which I don't think we want to have the whole shifting phase debate tonight, but. Well, that'll be a good, uh, a good thing to talk about next week uh, when we talk about Oxfed subs because that's the that's one of the biggest uh things to keep in mind when you're running an oxfed sub setup is if you change the output level of your aux then that you're going to be eff effectively changing your crossover point so uh we'll definitely briefly touch on that because i don't want to have it become a slug fest between all of us uh as people tend to have very very deep rooted opinions uh, on ver on the Oxfed sub versus non Oxfed sub. Uh, yeah, debate, I might be able but... to bring you some stuff for that. It looks like Pete has pink and white. If you want to touch on that or not. Cool. Yeah, Pete, if you want to touch on what pink noise and white noise are, that'd be that'd be great. Well, you guys explained it, but I have it to play for people to hear. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to hear how Zoom handles it. So make sure you have uh, original sound turned on when you do that. I'm just going to share computer audio. Okay. Perfect. Uh, let's see. I'm going to start with uh, pink noise. That. Yep. Oh, it's, it's loud. Okay. And actually, yeah, maybe Marty could share his screen because it's showing up well, on yeah, the. So what I'm gonna uh, do he's got an RTA up. I will let me. Uh, I'm going to spotlight Pete, but I'm also going to spotlight Marty's RTA, which stands for Real Time Analyzer. So that's going to show us, as you can see, I'm talking, you see different bars going up, and that's the frequency response of the program signal that's coming in on it. Uh, there's actually, and it looks like this is an EQ plug-in. So, uh, yeah, Pete, go ahead and, and play that pink noise again. Great. And did we did we give the what the definition of pink noise is earlier? Yeah. Equal okay, energy per octave versus white noise, which is equal energy per frequency. Right. Great. So now... So that and was then, pink noise still, right, Pete? That was, that was pink noise. And then I'm going to actually turn it back on with pink noise, and I'll switch to white noise so we can hear the difference and see Great. the difference. Pink noise. White noise. And the right, difference the, is pretty obvious on that on that uh, spectrum analyzer. Right. So when would you use one over the other? We tend to use pink noise more because, again, for the way we hear, we don't hear in technical terms. So. The lowest octave we hear, the highest versus the lowest octave is about 500 times wider in terms of frequency if my off-the-cuff math is good. So we use pink noise because to our ears it sounds a lot more even, whereas white noise is a more linear signal, but it doesn't really reflect how we hear. So pink noise is sort of the go-to in, uh, in audio testing because it better matches how we hear. 
Yeah, so that's to say that we would use pink noise in acoustical testing to see how flat our loudspeakers are in a space. But if we were testing our electronics, our mixer, or our signal path, we would choose white noise because that's not affected by how we hear. So, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I think uh, I wasn't looking at the, the Facebook stream, um, but I'm not sure if they saw those two graphs. So, uh, Omar, were you, ha did you happen to look at it? Where I spotlighted the two of them? Where was that going out on screen? I have a feeling it wasn't. Yeah, I see the, I see Marty's graph as we're talking right now. Well, now I see you again, but yeah, it yeah. was there. Okay. Great. Um, I just, yeah, I wasn't sure. I know they saw it on, on zoom here, but I, I don't know that they saw it on Facebook, but. And it, it's worth to note that both of those are all frequencies completely randomized within reason. Cool. All right. So thanks for that, Pete. Uh, appreciate you and Marty for having that, that graph ready for us. Um, and I, I stand corrected in Facebook. It was not so. Oh, okay. Great. So, Marty, so I, and I realized why it wasn't So standby. Let's, uh, we can show that one more time. I think it's worth showing just real quickly. And I'm going to spotlight the spectral analyzer again. Let me know when you got it up there, Marty. I think I see it. So we're looking at an X32 window. You want to bring that maybe more full screen you can see the bars uh i know that's going out on facebook now uh oh not this one marty the other one the the graph oh or am i just actually am i just spotlighting the wrong thing i think i'm spotlighting the wrong thing there we go sorry so pete do you mind playing that white the pink noise and then the white noise again sure start with the pink and we'll switch to the white So this is pink noise. And you'll see how it's not exactly flat. That's probably a clocking thing between all the applications we have here. But it should be pretty consistent all over them. And this is the white noise. Great. Great. And as we said, the pink noise is the equal power per octave, where the white noise is equal power per frequency. Um, I'd have to think about how you calculate power. It's equal energy per octave and equal energy per frequency. I don't know if that equals power. Oh, I believe good, that's uh, correct, yeah. Thank you for the correction, Mac. Absolutely. You know, uh, the semantics of these things are, are actually important <clears throat> when, you, uh, when you start getting to an upper level. Um, so, no, thank you for that correction. Um, great. So, Omar, do we have any questions that we, uh, we want to get to real quick? <clears throat> yeah, so with that 30-minute mark, this is perfect little time for that. So I got one question here real quick, and I'll double-check to make sure if I'm missing anybody. If I am... Uh, please just post that again real quick. I, I, I want to stay on track of this, but if I'm not, just post your question again. Uh, I have one from Sean Michelson Newman. On a general, I've seen a one's dropout specific frequencies completely down. Would it not be better to adjust so frequencies blend more? And I think, Justin, he was commenting that around when you were giving your example. Uh, I could be wrong. So, Michael, Sean, if it was somebody else, uh, let me know and we'll, we'll redirect. But, Justin, if you want to uh, tackle that one. Oh, Justin, you're muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, it really depends what you're trying to do. Um, if you're hunting a frequency you're having really bad problems with feedback with or a really bad uh, defect in the room, sometimes even the amount of control you have isn't enough to do it. So as a general rule, the narrower you go, the more you tend to cut. It's more precise targeting. So 
if you're doing broader things, you tend to go shallower. If you're targeting one specific thing, you tend to go deeper. At least has been my experience. Got it. I'll also say, um, and, ma and maybe the panel can uh, can step in and, and correct me if, uh, if this isn't their experience, but typically um, I'll do like cutting to notch out problem frequencies where I'll boost to maybe do things tonally. I'm typically also a cut only guy. I typically try to only do cuts, but if I'm gonna use boosting, it's to achieve some kind of tonal, uh, for a tonal reason as opposed to um, anything else. Or um, if, I'm try if I'm cutting, it's because I'm trying to get rid of something I don't like as opposed to boosting everything else. So like I said, I'm a, uh, and when I say cut only uh, EQ, uh, where all you do is cut as opposed to boost. So if there's, if you want more low end, I'll cut the high end as opposed to boosting more low end um, as my general go-to. Is that kind of how other people yeah. on the panel operate? Yeah, I would say so. Um, there's, you know, a number of different ways you can think about EQ and a number of different ways you can use EQ. If you're doing a mix and you're happy with the overall energy level and volume, but the lead singer or the lead guitar isn't quite there, you, you, you can bring everything down and bring the lead guitar up. Or think about EQ as a level control for individual frequencies or small bands of frequencies. So if you... If the lead guitar is like in one octave, you can you can find your EQ, bring that narrow band of frequencies up just a little bit, brings out the guitar without actually bringing up the volume of the entire guitar sound. I think at the end of it all, it's really one of the more powerful tools we have because, you know, back to the question Omar asked, I also tend to do, if we're dealing with feedback, I take a search and destroy approach where I'll grab the filter, I'll dial it as narrow as possible, dial it all the way down, and then just sweep the frequency until I find what's ringing. And then I'll start shallowing it up and spreading it out until I get just what I need. So at I, the end I, of the day, it's probably one of the more powerful tools we have to work with. Yeah, I, I pretty much follow that same method that uh, uh, Justin just mentioned. But I will say, having grown up with Yuri Little Dippers and, and uh, other narrowband uh, parametrics versus graphic EQs. Um, I wouldn't do this in the middle of a show, but if you're in rehearsals or in sound check, um, I would make a narrow filter and boost it and then sweep it until the feedback takes off. And then you know you've hit your frequency. And then you just, you have your hand on the down knob <laughs> while you're doing that because you don't want to, leave that screaming feedback for too long, but, but that's a really fast way to find feedback. As somebody once said, your choice, two seconds of bad sound or an hour and a half of mediocre sound, find it and fix it. I like that. That's, that's actually really good. I'm going to jump in with another question real quick. Uh, and uh, Marty, I'll let you take this one because I, I want to say you touched on this a little bit, uh, but Will Austin asks, what would be the application of either pink or white noise in ringing out, in ringing out a room? Mm, okay, that's a good question. Well, because, uh, so you would use pink noise um, because it, that will give you the flat graph, um, you know, if you were measuring it properly. Um, and also in your ears, you'll hear an equal level or should hear an equal level of low frequencies, mid frequencies, high frequencies. Now, um, where it comes in handy for feedback detection is um, uh, isolate a microphone, one microphone, the one that is more, most likely to feedback, and, and look at the RTA on your console. Uh, hopefully your console does have one. Look at it for that microphone. And you'll see in the graph as, a, as the spikes are going up and down, you'll see as you make that microphone a little bit louder, you start to hear it ring, and then you just start to hear it feedback. You'll see one of those spikes take off at a particular frequency. 
and you would zoom your um, uh, your EQ, your parametric EQ into that frequency, uh, narrow it down and uh, narrow its its bell curve, uh, its Q, and then bring it down. The uh, the RTA graph will will show you which frequencies are responding hotter than others in that particular microphone. Now a different microphone, because it's in a different place physically, might show you something different, might show you a different set of, of, uh, of frequencies that are hotter than others. Now these could, be, these could be coming from your main PA or they could be coming from the floor wedges. And that's kind of a challenge to figure out um, because if you're doing EQ for feedback control on your microphones, that uh, EQ result is going to affect all of your outputs. It'll affect the, the, what you're sending to your uh, floor widgets, to your house monitors, uh, to your broadcast, everything. But um, if you can uh, isolate whether the feedback is coming from your main speakers or your wedges, uh, you'd be better off doing your detection and your cutting at those outputs on those buses and that way that that you're not affecting your your inputs and to bounce off of what marty said um, we can use pink noise particularly to play all those frequencies through a speaker loudspeaker system whether it be a monitor system or a, or a front of house pa system or a simple one speaker on a on a pole and um, use the RTA or, or other software tools to show us what that speaker is doing, what the room is doing with the audio that comes out of that speaker. And um, most of us that are seasoned can use that data that we see to make EQ choices to that speaker to make it sound good and minimize feedback just in general. So we use, we use, the, we use the noise kind of in a similar way that video uses color bars to balance what that loudspeaker is doing in an acoustical space. So P, you and me are talking the same language now because I'm video, so color bars, is, I'm totally tracking now. Thank you for that. You uh, anybody who wasn't tracking before, now you're, now you're in tune, right? So, uh, uh, and I gotta ask, I, I'm gonna do it live. Everybody can see that I, I am apologizing to you. Is it, is it Mace Carry or Mac Carry? How do I say it? Mac Carry, I, I just read your lips. Is, am I saying it right? I didn't hear you say it. Sorry, it's Mac Care. Mac Care. Okay, cool. So Mac Care, I got one for you um, from Alan Pita. I might be overstepping my boundaries. Shouldn't they be act octave and frequency explanations musically and verbally or C talking? I'm not sure if I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Um, I don't really quite understand the, the question. We did explain that earlier. Okay. Can we just touch on it again, I guess, for Alan? Maybe he tuned in a little late. Yeah, try, try asking the question again. So Alan Pina says, I might be overstepping my boundaries, but shouldn't they be octave and frequency explanation musically and verbally, and then or C talking? Or C talking, maybe, is what he's trying to say? Alan, if you want to put that in the comments again, I'll, I'll bring it back up. I'm actually looking for it right now. Um, I think Alan just left the room a minute ago, so we're going to skip that and just keep going on. Ed, if you want to keep going on with the show, I apologize. I thought we... I, thought we, well, uh, I, yeah, I could yeah. define one thing more particularly, which is that a lot of what frequencies are the engineering definition of something that we're hearing, of a specific tone, like 1K tone. But an octave is a musical term that sound guys use to describe a certain frequency range. Maybe that would help uh, a little bit. Well, I, I also, you know, keep in mind when you're talking about musical octaves, so from A to A, for example, the, the standard tuning that the world has kind of settled on is A440. That's 440 Hertz. That means something that vibrates 440 times a second and makes that note A. So, in an octave, when you get to the next A through a musical scale, that A is going to be 880 hertz. It's a doubling of frequency 
gives you the octave note. And that's we're talking about the fundamental frequency. Of that? What's that, Justin? I asked if you want any of that. I can get 450. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, I don't want any tone. <laughs> I don't want right, to risk it. That little problem. <laughs> I don't want to risk it. Although my my we did an episode where one K tone kicked us off our streams. Um although my four hundred hertz tone coming off of my Q box didn't, so go figure. But um so when we do talk about octaves, uh when when sound people, audio people talk about it, the relationship between musical notes and the frequencies we're talking about are those fundamental frequencies and they follow the kind of the same path. So every time you come to an, you know, an A or any, any note, but when you get to the next higher register of that same note, the fundamental frequency of it doubles. And that's where, that's why we talk about octaves in that sense. So um, I hope that makes a little more sense and, and clarifies some of what we were just talking about. Um, I, I think you said Alan might have uh, might have departed. I think he said he was stepping out. But um, hey, Ed, we could actually demonstrate if we get the RTA up again. I can play a MIDI piano through the call if you want. Oh, uh, cool, yeah. And I, I think I might be able to bring up a graphic EQ in a minute too. So why don't you, uh, if uh, we can get Marty, if you can bring that RTA back up. So this, this is perfect. While you guys are setting that up in the background, real quick, Sean Michael Newman just asked how to use an RTA mic and pick noise. Which is if what I'm hearing correct is what we're setting up right now to test to show to everybody, right? Uh, uh, well, no, we have the uh, the RTA that. Um, uh, sorry, that Marty has um, had handy before. Yeah, we don't have a mic set up, so. Right. So. Uh, it'd be, but we do, but we can look at it still. Yeah. So let's do. Let me do this real quick. And, so, and just to. Just to touch on that question a little bit, what you would use an RTA and a mic would be to listen to pink noise, which is a calibrated tone of the hitting each octave with equal energy. And through the microphone, you then read it back and you can see if your sound system is reproducing that with equal energy per octave. And that's comparing the sound that's coming straight out of the mixing console versus the sound that the microphone is picking up in the room and then giving us a line amplitude and frequency line that we can use to judge how to e set the eq okay so i have pete i have you in the rta spotlit for everybody okay let's see if this works Great. So what we're saying, oh, we're not doing a share, so I can't annotate. So what we're saying when he plays that note is the, the first um, set of bars that jump is the fundamental. And then the next one is actually an octave higher. That's just how the harmonic series works. Uh, so Pete, if you don't mind playing that again. And, and uh, Marty, can you put it on uh, peak hold? I think, you, um, I, I think you can on that. And just to make it bigger, I'm sure. actually going to take Pete off screen so we can just see the RTA. Yeah, no one needs to see me. I don't see a peak hold on this particular meter here. So yeah, I don't think might be in the traps. But Marty, maybe you can draw with your mouse where those, those peaks are. Yeah, hang on a second. I, I'm not see, we're not seeing the whole band here either. I'm going to see if I can find a different sound too. Maybe if you have an organ sound and do that sustains. Yeah. All right, that should be better. Um, hmm. So let's see. I'm trying to think if I have anything else that. Well, I guess to vamp a little here, correlating what we're talking about in terms of octaves and musical notes, like Ed said, sort of the standard is 440 hertz is an A, but by that same note, 55 hertz is an A, you double it to 110, it's an A an octave up, 220 is the next A up, 440 is the next octave up, 880 is the next one up, and so on. 
But if you notice, because nothing about a hearing is linear, those gaps get increasingly wider as you go up. Exactly. Great point, Justin. I'm just going to do a quickie pop in. Marty was talking about if your console has an RTA analyzer, a lot of them don't, but there's phone apps now. So you just hook up your phone and let your phone mic take over. That's a, that's a great point too. I mean, they're, they're not calibrated and they're not the most accurate, but for typical, uh, just giving you an eyeball figure, they will uh, get the job done. So Marty, let me know when you're, you've got that ready and we'll, we'll spotlight you again so we can see that, that RTA. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds like a fun one, Pete. And, and by the way, a nice little trick with the phone apps is if you can, let's say you're getting a little ring in your sound system, if you can hum that ring into your phone during the show, very quietly, you can see where it is. It's, it's usually that frequency or an octave higher. <laughs> and don't ask me why it does that, but it, I, I found that to be the case. Great, I see right. Marty's got it up, so let me spotlight Marty. A pretty pure tone here, so let's see. Cool. Here we go. I hope that's not at 1K, though. That's A. Okay, so that's 880. This should be 440, actually. This is 440? That's that low? Wow. Okay, so can you play the next A? So those are an octave apart, and we can see on the graph where they hit. Are you able to play both at the same time? Probably not. Okay. Yeah, it's not a polyphonic. Okay. So, so if you'd like to see, I do have a chart that shows all of the tones and instruments and frequencies and octaves. This might be interesting to see. And um, it, it may ask, answer the question that was asked earlier that I didn't understand what the question is, but it may be about what sorts of things fall into what frequency bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can uh, get a screen share. Yep. You should be able to share. All right. Let me just find it. Great. So. And while, while he sets that up, I'm going to throw one to you to, to throw to the community. There's two questions that came in that I thought kind of might be in tandem to each other. And again, I'm a video guy, so I'm trying to just ask questions to, to you know, to creep in my nose. So Newman's asking a question that I thought was very good. Um, so you guys compare using your headphones versus what you're hearing in the room. And another question I thought lined in with that is, uh, again, from Sean, he's saying, I use my phone now, but is it worth getting an RTA mic? And I'm hearing kind of this, you know, it is for some things and some things, you know, the phone's fine. It's, it's you know, doable. So I'll, and I'll leave that to you how you want to throw that out there. Um, sure. So the, the, should you get an, uh, an RTA mic? Like that's an easy one. Uh, do you have something that you can use that mic to measure? So if you don't have a, you know, some sort of spectral analyzer or, I mean, even on some of these digital consoles, like, uh, we're using, I, Marty, correct me if I'm wrong. That's just the X32 kind of interface, right? That you're using. Uh, it's the XR18 or XR18. Okay, but it's in the in the that it's family. It's in the Behringer line, yeah. Yeah. So if you have an RTA mic, you could plug that into your console, and if it has an RTA function in it, you can see what's happening in your room by measuring the audio. If you play some pink noise, you'll be able to see some stuff. Uh, or if you run it live during your show, and then feedback takes off, you'll be able to see that on the RTA using that mic. And that mic is just going to be an ultra flat mic. Uh, that's the, you know, really all an RTA mic is it's, it's a measurement mic that's made to be flat in, in frequency response. So it gives you an accurate representation, but if you don't have those tools, then that's not gonna, not gonna help you to spend the money on an RTA mic. Um, well, I'm sorry. What was the first part of the question Omar again? Headphones. Um, do you guys use headphones when you're comparing it versus the room to what you're hearing? How important are the headphones you use when you're doing the, uh, you're doing the tuning. Um, does anybody on the panel want to take that? I mean, I don't I am, use headphones really for tuning. No, because I mean, the sound is just so different and you know, what's appropriate to the room. 
Um, at the end of the day, I mean, there's tools. I The way I like to answer this is, what's the right screwdriver to buy if you want to build a nice house? You know, it's a tool. Um, yeah, RTAs the... are good for a quick check and helping you dial in what you're hearing, but at the end of the day, you're tuning between your ears. Yeah, and you wouldn't use an RTA for doing good acoustical measurements and tuning on a sound system anyway, because an RTA is incapable of that. So you would have to use um, a, a um, smarter FFT yeah. um, analyzer, which is not an RTA, um, which will show you the difference between your input signal and the output s signal. And in that case, you you might need a uh, accurate measurement mic, but for just checking feedback frequencies or even setting delay times, there's no there's no real need for an RTA mic. Yeah, I but agree. I would use headphones if we're in a show and I'm hearing something that I don't like. I'm hearing some ringing. I'm hearing if I bring up a fader a little bit. I, Sounds like it's going to get ready to feed back or something. Um, or if I'm not sure where it's coming from, uh, I would use headphones uh, and solo different channels. Solo my output buses for my wedges and such to try and isolate the channel that is problematic. And using the technique of a, of a narrow band uh, parametric filter um, try and find that frequency while I'm soloing that channel wearing my headphones so I'm not listening to any other part of the mix. Um, that would be a powerful tool if you're in a show, during a show, and you're trying to isolate something to, to get rid of it. And, and to Marty's point, too, um, I use headphones to hear what the recording or the stream sounds like, not what the room sounds like. And to Marty's point, again, is, is that sometimes you might hear a ring over headphones that is not, you're not really hearing in the room. But everybody at home who's listening is hearing that. And again, that's where headphones come in as a tool to try and identify that frequency. And so the quality of the headphones have to do with more if they're, they're going to work every day rather than if they sound good. And those, those circumstances where you're just trying to use it to find a problem, you're, we're not actually using our headphones to generally make like studio quality mixes when we're mixing front of house. I think more important is also to know your headphones well, know, know the, the what you're listening to. It's, if the headphones are fantastic sounding headphones, but you don't really know them, it's not really going to be uh, an honest representation of, of what's happening. Yeah, different headphones sound differently. Um, I don't know if there are any headphones that are actually fully accurate without some additional processing. Uh, a lot of consumer headphones have uh, uh, voicing curves or frequency curves that are, are meant to make listening to music pleasing for the masses. So they'll have a boosted lows and perhaps boosted highs, which of course, you know, makes them non-flat and unsuitable for making mixing decisions. Um, the other thing that, this is one other thing that headphones if you have reasonably flat headphones and you know what they sound like and you know what they sound like against uh, studio monitors, you know, if they're something you're really familiar with, they can reveal something about your sound system. If the sound that you're mixing in the room sounds really different from the sound you're hearing in your headphones, then something could be wrong with how your room is tuned. And that's going to play a difference in uh, how you process inputs in terms of equalizations uh, to do the sound of your mix if you're also streaming from that same mix or from those same inputs to a different mix your input processing your input EQs if you're adjusting them for your speakers but your speakers are not 
adjusted properly, not frequency balanced, you could have your frequency balance of your stream be off. And, you know, headphones is, is just a very, very rough, rough way of checking that. Um, I was able to get my art, my uh, my graphic that I can show you guys. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly do that because we haven't seen a graphic EQ yet, and then we can kind of move on. So, yes, please move on from graphic equalizers. I hope never to see another one. <laughs> Indeed, too late. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, Mac, has have your EQing like I for me my EQing habits have changed as the gear has gotten better where I'm less of, I'm more apt to EQ to make it sound the way I want now because the EQ log um, algorithms are so good with phase response that I'm not worried anymore as, as much as I was with analog equipment and over EQing have it negatively affect what it's going to sound like. Although you can still get there now. It's much harder, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and, I mean, fortunately, pretty much everything today has parametrics built in somewhere. I mean, from very low level to the highest high end. And it's just so much easier to be able to adjust bandwidth and depth and f frequency than to try and push up or down a bunch of n faders on a on a graphic eq it, i mean yeah the graphic eq gives you that visual of looking at all the knobs but you know modern consoles and even separate eqs have displays that show you that same thing it's not you're not losing that graphical interface you're just li making it easier to do and, there and yes everything is is so clean today that you can really be more adventurous with EQ. There are different types of graphic EQs. I mean, the front face may look the same with up to 32 um, frequency sliders, but um, the circuitry, um, they can, from one frequency to the next frequency, from one slider to the next slider, the way that they interact can be very different from one model of graphic EQ to another model of graphic EQ. Um, Absolutely, but either one is less beneficial, in, in my opinion, than a parametric. I mean, no matter how those third octave bands combine, a parametric is still going to combine better because it's only going to be one filter. That's right. Yeah, I mean, right. we didn't really dive down that rabbit hole, and I don't think we want it tonight. But yeah, I think it's a it's a dead yeah. technology. I, I don't think we we need to even talk about graphic EQs. No, well, and, I but... mean that's the problem with the RTA is you know we don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. But when you're tweaking audio signals, it's not just about frequency. It's about phase. It's about timing and more filters equals more problems so but it should be said that graphic eqs are easier to use for a novice to get uh, to achieve the sound they want than parametric eqs because with a parametric eq you kind of need to know what your frequency you're hearing that you want to adjust see i, I don't agree yeah i really think i really think a parametric is easier because I mean, it, wh what's the advantage of the graphic? It, it, it you can you can push fa you can push EQs up and down the same way on a on a parametric, and you know, assuming you're using modern equipment, it, there's going to be a display of what's happening. And as as Justin pointed out earlier, EQ with your ears, not your eyes, but y the display reinforces what you're doing. I mean, it lets you know how far you've actually gone. I, I, I really believe uh, if you just sit down and try it, parametric is easier. Well, I, clearly you get more precision with a parametric than you're going to get with a, a fixed third, band, third octave band graphic EQ for sure. And as Justin pointed out, which again is probably 
getting a little beyond scope, but the phase relationships between those frequency bands are going to be uh, less predictable on a graphic, especially if you're making multiple adjustments to get notch out a frequency that's between your two bands, uh, you know, with that are two adjacent bands or something. Um, uh, but at any rate, I feel like we should still show people just so they have a, an idea of what we're talking about because we just we just had a pretty esoteric discussion about it and uh, we haven't even shown the oh, this, audience what it is. This is shallow. <laughs> well, um, yes. But if I could suggest, if you're going to bring up the third and look at it, it's a nice chance to point out the spacings of the frequencies and the octaves because it shows up really well on the graph. Yeah. Sadly, uh, using the editor... Uh, for my QL, I'm not going to be able to. It doesn't have the RTA show up on the um, on the actual uh, interface, but we'll at least be able to see what we're talking about. So first off, I uh, I threw some pink noise. Can you guys hear pink noise coming in? Because I don't hear what I'm sending. No, no, you got. It. Okay, we got some pink noise. Pete giving me the thumb go higher, or is it a good level? Okay, we'll stop right there. Great. So I'm going to bring in this graphic EQ. Sadly, it's the graphical interface of this uh, is pretty small. Uh, so it's going to, it looks a little small on the screen going out to um, to the stream. So stand by a second and let me just zoom it in for you guys. See, so that on the capture. All right, good. That's actually almost presentable now. So what we were talking about earlier, if you can see with my mouse, we have the frequencies here that each of these sliders can affect. And if you're hearing the pink noise, if I boost the 250 hertz, you should be hearing a change in that sound. Or if I cut 250 hertz, you should be hearing a change in that pink noise. Sorry, I forgot there, there was a ton of pink noise going to you guys. We also hear it on your voice, which is actually oh, good. Yeah, that's, that's true, because I'm sending to the same bus. So. Uh, for example, yeah, so what we were talking about earlier with the octaves, this is, I'm boosting right now 400, 800, I'll go down to 200, this is close, we're going to get to the, the 440 we had been referencing earlier, and let's go to 1.6k, so these are all an octave apart, now on the graph, they look like they're the same distance apart, but you can see how this graph, this graph goes from 500 to 1k, and 1k to 2k, and 2k doesn't have 4k it lists 5k next and 10k so these spacings are not to scale as they would be in the, the frequency range and these look like they're about the you know the same distance apart they are octaves apart but frequency wise we're jumping from 200 to 400 then 400 to 800 then 800 to 1.6k so 1600 hertz as justin kind of mentioned earlier now what's in between these is these are one third octave band EQs. So this is a third of the way there. So from 800 to 1K is a 200 Hertz jump. And then from 1K to 1.25K, so 1250 is another third of an octave jump. And then from 1.25 to 1.6 is another third of an octave jump. So that's how these graphic EQs work. And they're graphic EQs because you can see they look like a graph when you make changes and you can do all sorts of changes. But each and one of these faders is basically a parametric filter, but it's fixed and we with can't a, control it. Right. It's with a fixed Q and I'm gonna... Yeah, fixed few Q and fixed frequency. And Correct. each brand has a different style of filter. Exactly. So I'm going to bring that pink noise out because I'm sure that was enough pink for everybody to hear for a while. Um, yes, exactly. So there's much less that you can, uh, you know, flexibility with this type of EQ. But for a long time, this is what we had and what we were using to ring out monitors and to tune our sound systems before we had every tool under the sun that we wanted um, to do so. So... Um, it's something to be aware of. You may still find a monitor rack that's graphic EQs. I've actually, I've been seeing a ton of them on sale on eBay lately uh, and on the Facebook marketplace where people are getting rid of racks and racks of amps and graphic EQs just that would look just like this on the face. Obviously this is a digital model of one, 
but uh, that would do the same exact sort of thing. So go yeah, into, go into it's a digital car. picture. It's a digital picture of a Yamaha 1032. Right. Go into Sorry, any Marty? dive bar where a band will play and step behind the, the mixing board and you'll see graphic EQs like this. Yep. And, and, and all of them will be turned up full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, yeah. And this is another place where I, I practice cut only. So if I was using these to, to you know, uh, for ringing out monitors, for example, I would never do what you see in those dive bars with the boost at 3.5K and a boost at 4K. And, of course, you, gotta, you always have to have more 12.5K because, hey, why not? Um, you know, there's no reason for any of that. Where I would be doing anything is only cutting where I'm going into the negative EQing aspect of a graphic eq yeah those those boosts on the high end in those dive bars are all because the speakers are blown right exactly or if they're not they're going to be very shortly because someone is pushing way more high end than uh than you need to <laughs> mickey uh points out yeah don't forget the smiley face eq yeah that's exactly the you know this is exactly what you know where that was created was you know if you you bring all these down and you get that nice little smile. I should do it on the on the console itself to make it fast, but yeah, you would flatten these out and, until you get to the ends and but you see by making this this gradual increase, we're not getting a very straight linear line of steps. We're getting these little bumps and there's no way to get it really flat and that's what you end up doing in between these sliders, as Justin alluded to with phase, is cause more problems sometimes than uh, than you want to. And, and understandably why Mac is uh, all for getting rid of the graphic EQs. So with that, I'm going to disengage my graphic EQ. And I'm going to, uh, before I do that, I want to make sure in case anybody else shares that my view options are back down at original size. Boy, now you sound weird, Ed. <laughs> now I sound weird? It was a handy thing to have an AM radio because then you just had very few frequencies to work with in the first place and to get some of the reporters and anchors to sound a little more or a little less, you know. It was handy at the time. Yeah, um, Andy made a great point. We should start moving on to some other effects. Um, so Andy, why don't you, I think you had prepared something or you I, wanted to, I, to show I, I, something. I so did. why don't you go next? I did. Yeah. Cause if we get into compression, that's going to be another three hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd talk about delay and echo, which sometimes Great. get, which sometimes get interchanged, but um, I'm going to talk about delay first and try and just, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just to say about all of the incarnations. So when we say delay, it means we have a signal that is being delayed in time, period. That's pretty much all it is. Um, there's, delay gets used in uh, various things. We were talking about crossover points before. It gets used in speaker alignment. Um, we may be aligning one set of speakers in a room to another set of speakers. We might be aligning components within that speaker, and that's, a, that's a, definitely a feature of a professional crossover unit or speaker processor. They're usually called that these days. Um, so that, that might be considered also be called time alignment as well. It sometimes gets referred to as time alignment. Um, <clears throat> delay gets used in, for a lot of you, video sync. Getting, if you're doing a lot of video processing, it may delay your audio and, or sorry, it may delay your video which means your audio operator needs to delay the audio to catch up, to let video catch up. Um, so there's that. Uh, delay also gets used as a parameter in other effects, like reverb. Uh, for example, pre-delay, which would be the, um, the amount of delay applied to a signal before the onset of that reverb. Uh, and I'm guessing a lot of you have played with stuff like that. Um, then there's echo. And echo, to me, my, in my estimation, is it's an effect. It's like 
and I can play something in a second here uh, to demonstrate that. Um, but echo is, is an artistic effect. It's like echoing in a canyon or echoing in a cave or echoing in a room where the sound's bouncing around the walls and you want that for whatever reason. Maybe your drums, you want a little slap on the drums or on the vocal, that's an echo effect. The classic one is the Elvis echo on his voice. Um, the origin of that stuff actually comes from them, people using tape machines back in the day before we had electronic versions and digital versions of that where you would have the original signal and you'd send that in, uh, you'd have that, you'd be hearing that and that signal would be being split into a tape machine and recorded and you'd be listening off the playback head and that delay, that echo, would be created by the distance, the amount of time it would be, be the distance between the play and the record, uh, sorry, the record and the playhead. Um, and you could vary that only a little bit by changing the speed of the tape. And if you wanted um, feedback, which we'll get to in a second, and I can demonstrate that too, uh, you'd actually send a little bit of that delayed signal that's going through the tape deck back into itself. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna play with something here. I'm gonna see if this if you guys can hear this. Give me a second. All right. You hear a little slap back? I, I don't know if it's in stereo, but you hear it? All right. That's in stereo. That's two hundred milliseconds. Roughly. And then this is gonna get a little crazy here. I'm gonna call up this preset. Are you sure you wanna recall this? Yes. And then it might sound crazy. Yep. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, that last one, you know, those last that last one was a classic example of runaway feedback on a, on on echo. So that feedback is actually uh, that signal being fed back into itself. Um, I, I don't think I need to go into a lot of. I mean, I could share my screen, but the, the Yamaha, I'm using a Yamaha, and the Yamaha graphic here isn't that great, uh, I have to say, to show this stuff. But um, that's basically echo and delay in a nutshell. I see that Marty is showing a graphic of what looks like a tape echo. That's pretty cool. Is that a plug-in, Marty? Yeah, it's a plug-in. It's, uh, it's an Echo Cat. It used to be called an Echo Cat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where it's got one record head and a whole bunch of playheads on a very short tape loop. Yeah, and that's not that's dissimilar from other tape-based echoes uh, that you know, like an Echoplex. Yeah, Echoplex actually had movable heads. Yep, and the Echo Rec, I think, was another one, and uh, the the I don't know, Bryson Bryson it was a European model or the English model, I believe. Anyway, yeah, used to great effect by bands like Pink Floyd, for example. Yeah, I I think that's all that really needs. I don't know. Does anybody else have anything to say about delay and echo? Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I think you kind of covered it. Um, as we said, uh, you know, echo, I mean, one thing about, ec uh, sorry about, um, delay is, and I think you kind of what you showed, uh, with your second example, I don't know if was that, a, that was just a, an echo with multi like fed back to itself. Yeah. I don't was know that... if it was in stereo. I, I was trying to do stereo where you would have heard a little bit of ping ponging yeah, as well. There was oh, a little good. bit of that. Yeah. Um, but then there's also like multi-tap delays where it yeah. does a similar thing. It, you know, it'll, it'll delay and you can use, you can set the, the timing for those kinds of things. Um, some of our digital consoles have a tap delay where you can tap on a button in time with the music yep. so that you can get your delays to, to match the beat. Um, oh, and you know, you, you touch on a, a something that I, I meant to mention, which is, in digital consoles, some, not all, have input delay, which you want to just delay the input, and then some have output delay. The output delays are typically used just for lining up speakers, uh, the sound arriving at a listener from multiple speaker locations. Uh, just something to bear in mind. I know we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about speaker processing delay, and we're talking about echo and delay as an effect, but um, you wouldn't want to use the echo delay features of your mixing console to delay speakers. Although, 
I have back in the day when I didn't have a speaker processor that had delay in it, and I had to use a uh, Yamaha SBX 90s delay to do that, uh, but it, it wasn't by choice. Well, actually, so it's great that you brought that up because it, two different things that function in two different ways um, with the same name, so that's a, it, it could be a point of confusion for anyone who isn't familiar, but uh, it's great that you brought up that point of you not wanting to use a delay to do your speaker delays, but, and Marty mix, uh, mentioned having an XR18, which doesn't have output delay on the for the buses. So you That's can't right. you can't do that. So the only way to do it is to insert a delay effect at 100% wet, uh, which means 100% of the effect, none of the original sound is going through, and then uh, dial in your delay that way. So that's uh, it's just it just happened that Marty had that piece of gear that that is a digital uh, cons little digital mixer and uh lacks that feature and the workaround would be using a delay effect as an insert to achieve your speaker timing um delay so and and uh i, I wanted to mention a buddy of mine um michael uh ver, ver street i'm always going to butcher his last name um he mixes for a band called soja they're a reggae band and he uses a pedal. I mean, he uses like really nice digital mixing consoles. He still uses a Strymon uh, El Capi stand, which is a, it's a it's a tape echo simulator in a pedal form, guitar pedal form. And he sits that on top of his console, and he's using that to manipulate the band. Um, and for him, it works great. He doesn't want to use the onboard digital. Uh, or echo units that are in the console because he likes having knobs in front of him and all that that he can manipulate. Anyway. Great. Um, Andy, you said something interesting that uh, most digital consoles have delay on inputs. And in this day and age, with all of the internet streaming shows, that is one function that comes in handy when we deal with uh, like a lip sync. So trying yep. to match the picture that we're seeing with the audio that's associated with it, we we use that that delay on the input channel pretty regularly. Yep. Great. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I what I can pull up with my um, with my editor that will give us uh, an idea of what we something else we might want to see. Um, Omar, do we have any questions before I start taking on to an, another? area so yeah we got a couple questions here i'm not sure i think we answered this one already and if we have you guys just let me know i feel like andy kind of answered this already uh sean michael newman asks, if a room if a room echoes how do you use echo to cancel out the echo i feel like that was answered and no that wasn't answered you okay you can't yeah, for, i don't know if it was answered but you can't do that can't do that but I will say this is that I probably what he's talking about is sometimes referred as flutter echoes, which is this an acoustical term um, where like sound is just bouncing around the rafters somewhere. You might hear it come back into the system, that sort of thing. You can sometimes help that problem out with very surgical EQ. Um, that, that's the only way I know of to help solve that problem if you're if you've got a portable sound system coming into a room. You know, the longer term solution is to use acoustic materials and, 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 and architecture <laughs> to fix that problem. But that's that's the short answer to that question. I can say that um, to, to what Andy was just speaking about, um, I've done a number of gigs down at the Museum of Natural History in New York City in the rotunda, which is when you enter. It's a big, giant concrete room, huge high ceilings, and there is just a huge buildup in the low in the the low mids so around you know 300 hertz it's just crazy so what i've i've done in the past is i've walked into the middle of the room with my microphone and just the little rta app on my phone and i've just said hey 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 waited for the reverb and looked at my my phone to see where where the the frequency was still trailing and that's where i would cut on the pa so that I could counterbalance some of that buildup that was going on, that was what was resonant in that room. And uh, that would 
gain back some of the clarity. And in, in, I mean, these were like talk, speaking events and light music kind of things, but um, that's one trick to uh, to help combat it is uh, cut what is already very live in the room. So in a very, and, that's a very crude way of doing it, but with the- Yeah, and that reminds me too, Ed, too, is that if for, this isn't for loud music concerts or anything, but for uh, corporate events, events where the, there's not as a ton of volume that you need to generate is actually multiple speaker setups. So you're not driving any one set of speakers really loud because what that does is it excites the room's acoustics. And the the it's you know if you think about it like like a loud acoustic guitar feeding back you know it's the same idea, you know that you've got this resonant cavity that's just, you know, uh, you're yeah you want to turn it down if you can, and the best way to turn down a sound system in that situation is to get speakers closer to people, multiple sets of speakers closer to people that are time aligned. They have to be everything's got to be aligned, so. That also can really help with uh, cutting down on uh, those flutter echoes and things like that. Yeah. And, the, and those types of gigs I was uh, describing were the kind of things where the museum shuts down at 5 p.m. and you have to be ready at 6 p.m. for, a, you know, a cocktail reception before they move to the whale room. And it's one of those things where we've got, you know, a half a dozen Bose columns PAs as the PA and, uh, you know, you do with what you can guerrilla style in those situations. And, and, uh, that's the one trick I've gotten that I've used in that particular kind of space where there's no time and no actual gear. You know, it's like a little soundcraft impact, you know, mixer. So you don't have a ton of tools to do these things. And, you know, being able to, to grab something quick and dirty is, uh, sometimes the way to go. And, and to my, uh, Sean's point, uh, and and Andy's point using some of that corrective EQ by cutting what's already excited in the room is is a better way to go and and you know having speakers closer to people uh, so that they don't you're not trying to just push a wall of sound um, cool so should we mm. I, got, I got one more I could throw out there to the community oh, yeah, go ahead. Go again ahead. Uh, if this takes us backwards at all let me know and we'll uh, we'll skip it. Uh, Darren uh, Goldrick from the YouTube side is, is asking if we're going to mention the Fletcher Munchen curve of loudness. Um, I'll, I'll sort of take that because I kind of skipped it, which all goes back to the fact that nothing about the way we hear is equal or linear or consistent. No one in this panel hears the same thing. Uh, the Fletcher Munson curve is a little deeper than we want to go basically says that we're more or less sensitive to certain frequencies at certain volumes. The quieter it gets, the less we hear bass, you know, the loudness button on your stereo. So those curves are just a way of judging how we hear the balance of frequencies at different volumes. I don't know if we want to go much deeper in that hole tonight. No, I don't think we do, but we could add to that by saying that that concept adds to how we hear how we hear when you're mixing in a room and the level of the PA system and what you might perceive to be uh, bright or bassy based on what SPL you're hearing that content at. And um, it kind of plays into modern loudspeakers are much better at this than the older loudspeakers, but loudspeakers now are designed to better reflect that curve from the manufacturer. Whereas in the old days, we used to have to, and we still have to do on some levels, thank you, <laughs> reproduce that curve, you know, manually. And loudspeakers now are much better at maintaining it as we go. And it also goes into, we said, you know, EQing, EQ, uh, EQing PA systems flat, but what is flat? And it's more important that it sounds good than if the RTA looks flat and it plays in also into this concept. So I've put up just an example of the Fletcher Munson curve just for reference so people understand what we're talking about. And as you can see, it's, it's not a flat curve. Uh, and think of this as an inverse curve as to 
how our ear is sensitive, more sensitive. So these areas that dip are actually where we hear better in this, you know, three to five K range. And we don't hear as well. It takes more sound pressure for us to hear these lower frequencies down here in the spectrum uh, as equally loud. So it's kind of a, it can be confusing. Are you sure about that, Ed? Um, I think this is what is audible. So it, um, maybe you're right. No, it, so. If, it, if this is what is audible, Ed's explanation is correct. Yep, and it says threshold of audibility right here. Right, right, right. I, right. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's like when on office hours, when uh, whenever they do the, uh, you know, the, the sound checks and everyone sees a negative number getting, you know, they, they think that they're uh, getting louder but they're actually getting quieter because it's inverse numbers. It just, it totally throws you off when you're not used to dealing in, in negatives. And that's kind of the, this is a reverse of what um, graphically it would be. So we're, we're seeing that where those dips are, we hear actually better and it takes less sound pressure for us to hear those noises as opposed to something that was a lower frequency. We don't hear it. If you're going to EQ a room at a certain, for a certain volume level, you might want to almost uh, invert that curve, right? Well, most music mixers would disagree because they might <laughs> use sub bass to bring up the perceived loudness of the content without it hurting people, which is why we find these mixes that are very sub heavy, sub bass heavy because of that curve, we can absorb louder fre frequencies the lower it goes generally. Because and we're less so sensitive. We, and so, yes, and so we feel like the band is much louder than it is and you know, evading our eardrums from some damage at least. But it's a trick that some, some mixers use and. I don't know if I agree with it 100%, but I think sometimes it works. Right. Uh, you know, I wish I had my iPad connected because um, that would actually be the right tool to show some some more of the stuff I wanted to show. Um, but to, to kind of move on, um, maybe Trainer made a point that it we would be kind of doing a disservice if we didn't talk about compression. Uh, I know we kind of hop, uh, hopscotch, leapfrogged that's the term I'm looking for, uh, over dynamics and went straight to kind of time-based effects. Uh, so I think we should backtrack and maybe talk about compression just a little bit. Um, we had had someone who was going to do a demo on this, and they didn't uh, They didn't make it tonight. They had a, a conflict. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about compression, and then I can tee up maybe some... Uh, yeah, I don't have a demo, but I can certainly talk a little bit about what it does and what it doesn't do because there's a, I know over Pro Sound Web we've had endless discussions about what compressors actually do and a lot of people don't really understand how they work. And, I can screen share a compressor, a pretty simple compressor plugin for you to talk to if you want. That would, I think that'd be great. Yeah, that, that would be good. And basically what a compressor does is it allows you to set a level at which point it reduces the gain. So it makes, uh, well it, so the threshold knob that you see on, on Pete's, waves display there sets the level at which compression begins um then the and rest that's called that's the, the threshold right we want to make sure we use the the terms i guess yes threshold and really the the um and that's measured in db right mac 
Yeah, it's the level in, in, in DB. Yeah. I mean, it's theoretically. Uh, in, in my opinion, the two most important knobs on that display are threshold and ratio. So the threshold sets the level at which the compressor begins to act. The ratio knob sets the amount of gain reduction that happens above the threshold. Now it's not, there's still gain unless you have a limiter at which point when you hit the threshold, there is no more gain. But with a compressor, if you turn it up, it will continue to get louder, but it will get louder at a slower rate. It, it will go up less than you pushed up the fader. Um, the important thing to know is that it's acting on the whole signal. A basic compressor like this one is acting on the whole signal. So that a common misconception is that you could have multiple backup singers and you could compress the group so that the background singers don't get too loud, except if one of those singers sings really loud, it's going to duck everybody else. It's not going to keep those background singers leveled out. It's just going to make the loud singer drive down the gain of the overall mix. He's still going to be louder. Um, which I'm one reason I'm not in music anyway, not a big fan of bus compression because it's, it's not a lot of people think that you can keep the mix evened out by using a compressor on the, on the butt mix bus, but it doesn't all it, all it does is keep the level evened out. And if one singer is louder than the others, they're going to still be louder than the others in order to level it out. You need to have compressors, on every input. The, the other knobs you saw on that wave so was, was there was attack and release, which really is how quickly the compressor activates. And if there's a perhaps a wait before it releases, sometimes it compresses a lot. And then rather than just going back to full gain when music stops it goes back slowly but attack and release are measured in time correct whereas threshold makeup are right threshold and makeup DB. exact exactly are measured in db of signal level and ratio is measured in and in some arbitrary unit i don't know what the unit is but it's i, I guess it's it's four dB. Yeah, it's the ratio. It, over right, the exactly. It's attack, right. It's right? the it's the ratio of how much input results in how much output. So four to one ratio would mean if you raise the level eight dB above threshold, it will only go up two dB, but it still goes up two dB. But right at a four to one ratio. 8 dB of added signal results in 2 dB on the output. In other words, a 2 to 1 ratio is less of a compressor setting than 10 to 1. Correct. Yes. And, and a limiter is basically like an infinity to 1 or right. like 20 to 1 or something right. like that. Right. So it really hammers down and really doesn't let the output level post compressor rise at all, no matter how much input you send to it. Right. That's a, that's a good explanation, Mac. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I kind of was taught by one of my audio teachers very early on was to think about compression as not bringing down the level of something loud. It's that you end up with makeup gain, bringing up the quiet stuff. So if you think of it in the reverse, if you're because you're, you're you're decreasing the dynamic range, the the overall amount of loudness something is is going to get 
compressed. So if, if you know, I'm talking and it's this loud, when I compress it, now it's only going to be this loud. And if I use the makeup gain, which is a gain stage at the end of the compression, so you've you've brought down, for example, we're 8 dB as max at above the threshold level, but only 2 dB is actually coming out. So we've done that compression. We've, we've knocked those peaks down. But then we use the makeup gain to get the level even to where that peak would have been. So now that's the kind of the whole point is you want to get that level to back up so that you've got the same kind of level going in that you do coming out. Everything that was quieter in your signal, including the noise floor, is going to be perceived as louder because you've brought some gain up after you've done your yeah, compressing. I tend to never use makeup gain. And the reason is when it brings those quieter signals up, they may be feeding back. You may be fine with the level when it's in compression, but as soon as that compression releases and brings the gain back up, those mics may go into feedback. Yeah, that's really the live show classic is you, you got loud singers, you're clamping down hard on with compression, they finish the song, and then everything explodes in feedback because of exactly what Mac just said. Yeah, right. I, I don't find makeup gain to be my friend. <laughs> Got it. Um, I, I mean, I use it, uh, especially in these situations, like where we're streaming or doing broadcast. Uh, in live PA, I like never, I, well, sorry, I hate whenever, whenever anybody ever says never or always in terms of audio. My practice is to not use compression in anything going to a wedge monitor on a stage with musicians. So that's, that's my practice. I think that's a pretty accepted practice. I don't want to speak for the entirety of the sound world, but I will say that's a pretty strong, uh, rule of thumb to follow is don't put compression into your monitor mixes if there's wedges on the ground you're ru you're ruining your gain before feedback as mac was just talking about and that can be uh pretty pretty bad stuff uh for feedback uh if you're using in-ears that's a very different story uh and let's see what what pete is sharing okay so yes pete's sharing pete you want to talk to what you're sharing real quick yeah this is just a snippet from um from a, a, a loudness website, but it demonstrates what Ed was talking about. The green is an uncompressed waveform, uh, audio waveform like you would find in any sort of audio editing software. And then the red is if that same waveform was limited very heavily. And you could imagine all of these peaks that you see here are actually extending above and below um, basically zero so they would be clipping, but the limiter is cutting them off, raising up what Max said, uh, raising up the noise floor and gain before feedback. So, you know, if we can look here, whatever this sound was in this valley is a lot louder in, on this red example than where it is on the green example. So that could be noise in the room. It could be something in an instrument that you actually want louder or um, some some other desirable effect but generally speaking this yeah this is the curse of normalization in digital audio workstations yeah norm you know generally speaking this red waveform will not sound as musical or natural as the green and um, you will um, your ears will fatigue faster if you listen to a content that's this limited for too long. Exactly. Now, Ed, I, 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 I wanted to ask about something you said just a moment ago. Sure. Um, practice, best practice is not to use compression on your stage monitors. How do you arrange that if you're using compressors on your input channels? Which well, that, then gets that all sent depends. to your then get sent to your bus, uh, your wedge buses. That depends. So, um, you know, on, on week one, we talked about signal flow and we, I kind of showed the block diagram of the console that, uh, we were using for that example, which was my GL, uh, 2400, uh, by Alan and Heath. 
And that particular console, the auxiliary sends, because I would use that console for mixing front of house and mixing monitors from front of house uh, with four auxiliary sends. So on that particular console, it was set up so that the auxiliary sends were pre-insert, pre-EQ, pre-fader. So uh, the inserts were to you know, not getting even the EQ because that, as, uh, as we talked about earlier, if you make an adjustment you know, to your EQ for your channel and it goes to your monitor, you might cause feedback because you now you've undid the things you had done to counteract that. So um, that's that's a, a big consideration. But if um, when I was speaking earlier, you know, if you have a separate console that's handling monitors, um, I would not be using compression on anything that's going to a wedge monitor. Uh, again, in your monitors, very different story. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna use compression. Uh, well, I'm gonna use some limiting as ear protection for the the artist on stage because whether they want it louder or not, I don't want to accidentally send something that's so loud that I'm gonna pierce their eardrums. They have a volume control on their body pack, so they can bring up their overall volume. But I want to have something that that stops peaks from you know accidental stuff doing hearing damage to them. But you know. That's a maybe we can talk some about that next week when we talk about routing, um, but that that's kind of where I was going with that is that if I'm doing monitors on a separate console, I'm not going to use compression on the main vocal uh, when there's open wedges. Again, for the gain before feedback, I don't want to reduce that. So I hope that answers your question. And, and also, the point of the monitors is to let the artists know what they sound like. Compressing it doesn't let them know that. Great. One, um, one of the things that compressors are useful for, too, is if um, you're starting off and you um, are testing out compression to begin with, you might try it on one input, like a vocalist, for instance, or a bass guitar. But you could also try it on, uh, last week we talked, or two weeks ago we talked about subgroups, you could try it just out on, on some subgroups or something. And um, play around with it on a certain set of instruments or even your full mix and just lightly start to adjust and hear what it does to a greater number of inputs just as a learning um, as a learning uh, practice. Yeah, and when, and when compression is used well, it's really like glue. And if, if you hear a mix where there's no compression, let's say it's a bunch of wireless mics, it's a talking head event and all that, and people are talking. It's just like things pop out here and there because people's dynamics are going all over the place. And and really just a general rule of thumb is less compression is good. You know, like try and use a little bit on each input. So like what I typically do and a lot of my colleagues do is we'll set a compressor on a particular mic and just light up one gain reduction light. It just smooths that input out and gives it a little bit and gives you a little bit of control over it. You don't need a lot, just a little bit. And then the next um, gain stage that that mic along with the other mics are going through, like for example, let's say your recording uh, path, you might just want a limiter on the recording path in case someone really lays into their mic. It doesn't send you into full scale, you know, distortion on your on your digital input. Um, it will catch that before it gets there. Um, that's a really good practice. And what you'll hear in the PA too is, you know, with a little bit of light compression on every input, nothing's like jumping out at you and racking up your ear. Um, on a musical end, uh, like if, I, if there's a horn section, I'll do the same thing with the horns, except I'll put a compressor on the group. It really glues the horns together. So when they're playing all together as an ensemble, it just it just sounds so smooth through the mix. Um, and it gives you a master control for the horns, for example, on, you know, so the vocals can still cut through if they're playing along together. Things like that really help. Cool. Uh, just to touch on some of, uh, thank you, Andy, sorry. Um, just in the interest of time, to touch on some of the other dynamic effects that we have. Uh, we mentioned limiting which is really a severe form of compression with a higher ratio as Matt kind of walks us through what that is. Uh, I think Pete mentioned uh, in infinite to one. So that's like 
this if any level that gets to this threshold that's all we're going to get and we're going to see that squared squared off kind of wave that pete showed us that was in red in that earlier example um there's also things called gates uh noise gates so there's a threshold and anything that is below the threshold you don't get to hear at all it just cuts it off but as soon as something passes the threshold it opens the gate and you're able to hear that um i don't have a gate set up on this particular mic but um where you hear gating if you've ever heard something where the words uh you know the beginning of someone's words are getting cut off uh that's typically that they have a gate that um is just too tight and the threshold is too high and you're missing some of the some of the beginnings of their words um or maybe the attack is too uh or, too or else they're on zoom right right we've heard i'm sure we've all heard it on zoom exactly um that's part of the echo canceling uh it's using some kind of gating and and whatnot to uh to do that um yeah i can kind of demonstrate an expander or a noise gate sure uh, so i've got original sound turned on right now which means that zoom's noise canceling and echo canceling is turned off now i have a i have a noise gate uh, expander on this microphone and um I, if i go to oh no right now it's turned off so if i'm if i'm quiet you might hear a lot of noise from the room And I'll turn it on. And it all went away, except when I talk, the noise gate turns, uh, kicks in, or turns off, actually. The noise gate turns off. And it's uh, set to, a, it's adjusted so that the attack and the release are pretty smooth. So you might not even be able to notice that it's there. But um, you hear it. Now you hear it, it's all yeah. natural. Right, it's bypassed now, and then once you talked, it opened the gate, and the noise comes with it. Right, as you open the gate, and if you like, if you did a longer attack, uh, sorry, if you did a longer release, after you stop talking, we would hear the noise for a longer amount of time before it decays and the gate closes again. So you might have, uh, you know, if I did a no, if I did a longer release, it would take longer for the noise to come back in. Uh, uh, no, you're right. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> You right. hear so the noise. So you I might will, have. Um, on a, I'll, I'll, re, I'll increase the, the release time. And you're hearing more noise before yep. the gate kicks in. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm on ears, so I'm hearing it very clearly. Uh, okay. If you're not hearing it, you know, if you turn up a little bit, you might get it on your phone. You, on phones, you may not hear it if you're watching that way. But uh, the noise is definitely taking a lot longer before it, it drops off to nothing. So. Um, Cool. And the attack uh, on a on a gate would be how fast from when you uh, exceed the threshold that the gate opens up. So you would want uh, you might want a fast attack, um, you know, so you don't cut off those words like we were talking about earlier. Cool. Um, some of the other things uh, ducking is. Oh. Yep. You want ducking ducking yeah. just because I was using it earlier. Um, ducking actually falls under compression, which is basically using an external signal or side chain to control the compression. So if I have... It's always the end of the track. Always. <laughs> but no hands on the mixing console because my mic is side keying the track. The music automatically turns down when I'm talking and then when I stop talking comes back up yep so that's ducking yeah. and although your description of it as compression in most duckers the way that they are built in consoles that have duckers it's actually gating you are correct yes i prefer to use a compressor i make a compressor be a ducker because it just seems to work smoother to me I've never really been able to get great results with a ducker, but using a compressor as a ducker, as you just did, yeah, I, I find to be very effective and very useful. Yeah, that was a, what... a great point, Mac. That's a I, I feel exactly the same way. I'm also I like hardware, so that's you know I never had a hardware thing called a ducker. It was always side chain on a compressor. So yeah. Um, which also could be called a key input. Um, I know on, if you're using 
any of the Behringer or Midas products, you might see in your compressor, there's a key uh, source. Uh, that's that's what we're talking about. Same thing, key, side chain are, are uh, for this, we're gonna say those are kind of interchangeable terms. And and there's one there was one parameter that didn't get mentioned around gates, which is a function of ducking, which is the range. And the range is when the gate is engaged, when it's when it's clamping down, how much is it clamping down? Is it clamping down everything or is it clamping down just by ten or fifteen dB? So you get a little sound through. Which is what Justin was basically just demonstrating, you know. Uh, so, because when he started talking, you could still hear the music a little bit. It just right. I, it. I, I think you would rarely want it to to duck away completely. I mean, it's it's most common use is for announcers. Exactly. Over program, and you you know, you don't want the program to go away, but you want the announcer to be heard. Yeah. Right. The only the, the only place you'd want it to go to maybe zero would be with with gate with drums. You know, if you're if you're doing proper gating on drum drums and your toms and things like that, you don't want those mics on if you can help it. Right. They're That's very, a whole other discussion. A very common musical application for gating is the interchange between the kick drum and the bass guitar. Well, that's actually um, I would I would say ducking. Uh, that's ducking. I, I commonly yeah, duck the bass guitar using this kick drum as the side chain input. So the kick drum, when the kick drum hits, it just ducks the bass guitar just a little bit to give a little more punch, a little sonic room for the kick drum to to punch through. So, um, yeah, no, absolutely, Marty. Great, because great it answer. is all about the kick drum. Always. <laughs> Stay tuned for the next six hours while our panelists discuss the preference and dynamics. Yeah, yeah it's like this turned into the audio opinion show for a lot of for a lot yeah. of this. Um, so we're, we're getting close on time. Um, Omar, are there any questions we can talk about? And then I think what I'll do, uh, because we're not going to get to go through many more effects, I might just play with a couple so we can hear some funny things happen to my voice. So, so I kind of have one here from, uh, Sean Newman again. Is there a trick using an attack to get more punch from the base? And I'll leave that to whoever, whoever wants to take it. With a compressor. Uh, it kind of depends on the player, too. Yeah, and a little, and uh, you want some, uh, like, I know, usually it's like 2 to 4K to get that little, to get the high end of the, also if they're playing with a pick or their fingers, that can change that, can change that frequency. Yeah, um, to get more attack, using attack to get more punch from the bass. The attack on the compressor. Um, I don't know. I, I think did, that's what he means. If you did a we, slow we also attack, the lid off dynamic EQ either. Right. Well, we haven't talked about multi-band compression or any of that. You know, the other more esoteric stuff, like I mentioned. But we can uh, again, we can always continue these discussions on Discord. Um, maybe Omar can put some of those links to our Discord. You can join our Discord and. Uh, uh, you know, we'll continue those conversations. There's a, a channel for every uh, episode that we've uh, since we started our discord. So you can uh, chat with us there. There's audio channels. We can always uh, we're always happy to to discuss, uh, you know, between episodes of AV Tech Talks. That's the place where you would want to uh, to do that. Um, so, Omar, sorry, any other questions? Nope, that was it. That was it. Wow. If I can, uh... Well, all right, so tell me I got one more, but I don't know if it'll take us over or not. So this is a little bit long. I'm not sure to give this one to. Um, so Otis Grainville from YouTube had asked a little bit earlier, uh, and this is a two-part scenario, or not two-part, but there's two parts to it because of the uh, the word count on, or word count limit on YouTube. So, for, uh, so it goes, I run two XLRs from an LS932 into a UMC 40, 44 HD for my streaming PC. Then delay my audio in the vMix software, a 0.80 millisecond delay, my audio to match my video. Should I delay at the mixing console or inside my streaming software? Hmm. I right, assume, so what would you do? <laughs> uh, so my answer to that would be, it depends a little bit. If you're from the mixing console, if 
You don't have to go to any other speakers. If you're not doing it, if you're doing this in your home, sure, you could do it from the, you know, just to a stream. If you're in the real world, uh, you know, in a hybrid event situation where you have a PA system, you may not want to do this at the console because the delay for lip sync in your vMix might be different than the delay you would need, um, you know, between iMag on a screen or you may not want any delay on your the the voice. So uh, I'm going to say it depends on, on your use case. Um, and, and it would have to be on the output that feeds the stream, not on any other part of the console. Right. I mean, most sound men would want to do it at the console so that they can be in control. Right. But, but overall, I don't think it really matters one way or the other, as long as there's somebody who understands what's happening. Right. Doing but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it on the input, uh, you know, like on the input of the digital console, uh, as Max said, I would do it on the output that's feeding the stream. And again, if you're a one man show kind of thing where it's just, it's you and your vMix machine and, and you've got a console that's just bringing in your inputs, uh, it doesn't really much matter. But again, once you're in that situation where you've got more destinations to send audio, then you have to really think about, you don't want to do it too early in the chain and then, you know, affect the, the sync relationship with some other video down the road. Um, I'd say doing it at the streamer is a foolproof way of making sure that it's not going to affect anything else. Right. And right. again, also, as, as long as you have the ability to monitor it at the streaming device, you know, if you're on like an ATEM Mini or ATEM Mini Pro or Pro ISO, for example, that doesn't have a headphone jack, you may not you may not want to do it there. And those are limited to like eight frames of delay if you're on the analog input. So um, yeah, it, it really depends on your setup and your situation, but. Ed, can I add, add something? I mean, generally, Absolutely. generally the line of logic that most people use is to apply delay where it's required. So where the two signals are coming together and they're off. So as to not affect anything upstream like if that mixing console is also sending that audio to other places. And so if you're marrying, wherever you're marrying the audio and video, that's where the delay should be set, generally speaking. So like what Marty said, in, in the streaming application is probably the best place to do it. But if you're also sending video from your streaming software to an outboard recorder, and audio from the audio console to that outboard recorder, then you might need two different sets of delay, one for what's inside of the software switcher and another one for making the record deck in sync. So it, right. but generally speaking, applying the delay where it's perceived as off is, is generally better. It will give more flexibility. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for adding. And eight, eight frames is, is actually, you know, quite a lot. It's that's 240 milliseconds. Um, uh, depending on your, uh, your FPS. Yeah. Depending if you're at 30 or 60, you know, that it, the, their frames depends. Frames is not a, um, consistent time base. Okay. Uh, In my world it is, but yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> So, um, so what, what you, what, sorry, you said 240. Yeah. 30, 30 milliseconds per frame. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 30, yeah. 33 milliseconds a frame at 30, that's at 30 frames a second or 20, 29, nine, four, nine, nine, really. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, right. But if we're at, if we're doing anything at 59, nine, uh, sorry, 29, nine, seven, uh, or 59, nine, four or 60, that's going to be cut in half. So. You know, right. eight frames will be 120 milliseconds, so uh, roughly, give or take. Um, cool. Uh, so, Omar, any last questions? Because uh, I, I see that we're just past the hour. And again, audio just is such a vast thing. It always takes us a little more time to cover than than we think we have. Um, so any any other questions we uh, we can get to before we close this out for the night? I have no other questions here on my end. Not that I can see at least. Okay, cool. So what I'll do just real quick. Oh, I have to remember what order we're doing this. Is 
because we didn't really get to talk about it. Um, so you should be hearing some reverb on my voice now. Some, this is a, a little uh, reverb hall. And I've got just a different type of reverb. This is a RevX room reverb. Hey, Ed, get out of the cave. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Uh, this is a, I can't hear it, so I don't know how much, I'm probably swimming in it right now. This is a plate reverb. You are swimming. Yeah, so I can go down here. I'll keep that a little lower. I set up a mono delay. Um, I don't know how many milliseconds I'm running, but uh, this is like 270 milliseconds. So this is probably, you know, just over a quarter second delay. Um, one of the other fun things, though, that I wanted to uh, to show was, you know, you can do effects are like these cool things and you can make really interesting stuff. So if I bring my pitch shifter and I come down, you know, two octaves, it probably sounds a little demonic if you're hearing that. Oh, we're not hearing that. Hold on, am I not doing 100% wet here? Oh, sorry, because I, I turned it off. That would be I thought I had. Huh. I don't know why we're not getting. We should be hearing that, but we're not. Oh, well. So that was very anticlimactic. Um, but we can have you can have fun with effects. There's there's tons of stuff that is. Uh... Yeah, why are we not hearing that? That's such a such a bummer. Um, there's things you can do that are just wild and out there, you know, like psychedelic sounds or you know pitch bending or choruses or flangers. There's there's all sorts of things. So, um, you know, we'd love to continue the, the talk on Discord. And uh, maybe we can get a session like we did with that ATEM session a couple of weeks ago. Maybe we can get a session together and we'll we'll just experiment with tons of different sounds. If any of you guys are are up for doing that, uh, I would love to have you come in and and uh, and we'll show the our audience uh, in Discord, our community, just uh, some of the weird, interesting things that you can do with uh, with all sorts of effects on uh, on voices, on on instruments and whatnot. So, sorry that was uh, that didn't go off the way I was hoping, but um, I'd love to take a moment to thank everyone on the gallery, uh, on the panel. So, uh, you know, Marty, thank you very much. Andy, Justin, Mac, Pete, uh, Ricardo, thank you for joining us. Um, I think it's the first time you've been here. That's great. And Iris as well. Thank you for being here. Um, Omar, you want to tell us just real quick what's coming up on Wednesday on the podcast? Talking myself. Yeah, so Wednesday coming up this week, we have uh, Rock and Bo, who is a entertainer uh, who did the shift from obviously doing it live to virtual and did it very well. Uh, so we're talking about how, how the transition was, how she kind of kept herself busy, um, and how she's going to kind of explain to you guys what you could be doing to transition to that route as well. Obviously, all of us that are on here are already doing it because we're on the panel, so we're, we're already virtual. Uh, but for the guys who might be struggling out there or are trying to figure out their way or, or need some advice or some tips and tricks, uh, Rock and Bell is going to tell us how she kind of went from doing it live to doing it virtually and her little method and she, tricks that she went to uh, to go that route. That's awesome. Great. Um, I want to take a minute to uh, thank uh, DVE Store for their continued support of AV Tech Talks. Without, uh, without DVE Store, we wouldn't be broadcasting in all the platforms that we're broadcasting to in 1080p. So uh, you can go to dvestore.com and Tell them thank you for letting AV Tech Talks show actual text and demonstrations that are legible, as opposed to just being at low resolution like they used to be. Uh, now you guys get to see everything, uh, which means unfortunately you get to see me in high resolution. But uh, you know, thank them anyway, and uh, we'd love they'd love to hear that stuff. It's uh, dvestore.com. Guy and his team are are super helpful. They'll they'll get you set up with any of the gear that you need. Um, with that, next week will be the final week of audio month where we're going to talk about um, destinations and routing and mixes. So that's going to be a, an interesting interesting conversation. Um, I have a couple demos. We're definitely going to talk about Mix Minus. Again, that was the, the number one thing people asked us about um, when, we, when we put it out there. What people wanted to learn was Mix Minus. So we will have a Mix Minus demo. Um, 
we'll also i'll have some other stuff uh mac i think i saw your hand real quick so no, i would just say i'm all in on any discussion of mixed minus excellent yeah you how many how many you're running what 24 or something like that 24 24 in your day job that's that's a lot to keep track of so uh we'll get into the weeds on that next week um and yeah so that's uh that's gonna that's gonna be it for for tonight so i want to say good night to our facebook and our youtube audience uh you still have enough time to get over to office hours there they'll be starting up any minute so if you haven't gotten over there go check out office hours we're also very thankful that they've been able to work with us to make sure everybody can see all the content that they want to get you can just park your butt in front of the the computer start with us and then you go over there and uh and you just get an overload of all of the knowledge you can take in in one evening on a monday night so Thanks. Oh, what happened there? Sorry. Our audience over there are not seeing what I thought they were seeing. There we go. So, uh, yep. Good night, everybody. Uh, we'll see you all next week, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Have a good night. Good night.